return to base. After a remarkable mission, Booster 11 from Flight 4 has officially made its way back home. There's much to unpack, particularly regarding the performance of the Raptor engines, which are drawing significant attention. Additionally, a new launch license for Starship Flight 6 has just been granted, marking an important milestone. NASA and SpaceX have also revealed a critical upgrade that will play a key role in the future return of the Dragon spacecraft. And ahead of that, Crew-9 has implemented a significant change at its new launch pad. Join us as we explore these developments on today's episode of Great SpaceX. The successful recovery of B-11's sections has generated significant excitement across the aerospace industry. This is understandable, as SpaceX's primary objective for this flight was to achieve a controlled landing of the Super Heavy booster. They succeeded when B-11, despite catching fire on one side, safely reached the water, avoiding the explosive fate of B-10 from Flight 3. Escorted by the Haas Ridgewind recovery vessel, B-11 made its way back to land on the evening of September 25th, Texas time. It was then transported to the Massey test site for further analysis. Images of the recovered section closely resembled those previously shared by Elon Musk, showing that about two-thirds of the aft section remains intact, while the rest likely separated and now lies somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico along with the upper portions of B-11. Despite this, the recovered aft section holds immense value, particularly for understanding how the engines performed during the flight and what issues arose both in the air and upon landing. These insights will provide crucial data for SpaceX's ongoing analysis. The focal point of this investigation will undoubtedly be the condition of the Raptor engines. According to Musk's photos, only 14 engines remained attached to the recovered section, many of which show signs of deformation. This is likely due to the intense heat during flight, which may have compromised the materials, making them more susceptible to damage from impact. Additionally, there appear to be remnants of soot or debris inside some of the engines, possibly from incomplete combustion or contact with seawater. The internal wiring and piping also show significant damage, with burns and breaks evident in several areas. It's possible that the crash into the seabed further exacerbated the condition of the engines. The impact may have caused deformation, while the corrosive effects of seawater might have contributed to the separation of various engine components, including parts of the outer and inner rings. It's even possible that the debris inside the engines is simply mud from the ocean floor. SpaceX's upcoming analysis will determine the full extent of the damage, but based on current observations, it's clear that the Raptor engines have not yet reached the level of reusability SpaceX aspires to. However, there are reasons for optimism. Despite the visible damage and the partial separation of engine components, none of the engines appeared to have exploded. Had an explosion occurred, the engines and surrounding structures would likely have been far more severely compromised. This resilience provides a solid foundation for SpaceX to make improvements. The absence of engine explosion suggests that while there is room for optimization, the core design is sound. The next step for SpaceX will be to address these issues and make the necessary upgrades to the Raptor engines. The question now is, how will SpaceX refine and enhance the Raptor to meet their ambitious goals? Currently, SpaceX is utilizing the second version of the Raptor engine, known as Raptor 2, which will likely continue to power the next three Starship version 1 flights. In a recent interview at Starbase, Musk admitted that while Raptor 2 is more compact than its predecessor, Raptor 1, it remains complex with many intricate components such as flanges and bolts. Although these parts make the engine easier to disassemble and refurbish after each flight, they also introduce several vulnerabilities. The additional complexity allows heat to accumulate in the engine, making it more susceptible to damage and increasing its overall mass. To overcome these challenges, Musk proposed a transition to a welding-based design, which would eliminate the need for flanges and bolts. By reducing the number of joints and parts, SpaceX could minimize potential failure points and improve the engine's reliability. However, this improvement would likely only be applied in the next engine iteration, Raptor 3, which could first appear on Ship 33, the prototype for Starship V2. Raptor 3, recently unveiled by SpaceX, 
promises significant upgrades. In terms of thrust, it is expected to produce 280 tons, a considerable boost from Raptor 2's 230 tons. In tests conducted last year, Raptor 3 achieved an impressive 350 bar of chamber pressure. This increase in thrust aligns with SpaceX's long-term vision of making Starship the most powerful and reusable rocket system ever built. However, reliability remains the most important factor. Visually, Raptor 3's black exterior stands out, and this color may signify the use of more heat-resistant materials than in previous versions. Moreover, fewer individual components are visible on the upper part of the engine, likely due to the adoption of Musk's proposed welding technique. Additionally, Raptor 3 will include a secondary cooling system, eliminating the need for a heat shield and reducing the engine's mass from 1,630 kilograms in Raptor 2 to 1,525 kilograms in Raptor 3. These improvements suggest a more efficient, reliable, and durable engine design. Yet the question remains, can SpaceX continue to improve engine reusability without waiting for Raptor 3's full implementation? SpaceX aims to reuse Raptor engines as soon as possible in the upcoming flights, as evident from B-11's recovery. Despite the booster being damaged by seawater after its controlled descent, some of the engines might have remained intact or even reusable had it not crashed into the ocean. This demonstrates the critical importance of catching the booster with the Mechazilla arm during Flight 5 and subsequent missions, allowing SpaceX to immediately assess engine conditions post-flight and improve turnaround times. However, regulatory hurdles remain, particularly from the FAA, which insists SpaceX continue its ocean landing procedures. This slows down SpaceX's ability to rapidly recover and analyze its rockets and engines, delaying crucial innovations. If SpaceX could fully implement its land-based recovery plan, progress toward rapid reusability could accelerate significantly. If you agree, drop an agree in the comments section, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on SpaceX's incredible development journey. Regarding Starship, I wanted to provide a quick update on the upcoming Flight 6. The FCC recently granted a license for SpaceX's Flight 6, valid from October 25th of 2024 to April 25th of 2025. The license details state, launch vehicle communications for the test flight mission launching from Starbase, Texas. The first stage booster will either return to the launch site or perform a controlled water landing. While it's important to note that whether this flight will happen still depends on the FAA's approval, this license from the FCC is a positive step forward. It offers motivation for SpaceX to keep advancing its operations. But first, the focus is on Flight 5. If SpaceX performs well on this next flight, we can anticipate Flight 6 moving ahead more swiftly. In terms of hardware preparation, Ship 31 completed its static fire in mid-September, while Booster 13 has recently finished cryogenic testing at the Massey site. A static fire test for B-13 is expected soon, either before or after Flight 5, and interestingly, Elon Musk has stated that Flight 6 will be ready to fly before Flight 5 even gets approved by the FAA. This suggests SpaceX is already laying the groundwork for the next launch, staying ahead of the regulatory process. Let's stay tuned for these exciting developments. And now that we've wrapped up the Starship section, let's shift focus to an exciting update about Dragon's capabilities. During the Crew-9 pre-flight briefing, NASA's Commercial Crew Program Manager Steve Stitch revealed a significant upgrade for Dragon in terms of launch and return safety. He announced that Dragon's Super Draco thrusters now have the ability to activate in emergencies, particularly in the case of a parachute failure. These thrusters would fire just before the capsule hits the water, softening the landing and ensuring the safety of the crew even in the worst scenarios. Interestingly, this safety feature has been a part of Dragon's design for quite some time, as SpaceX's Bill Gerstenmaier confirmed. However, it has never been necessary because all previous Dragon landings have gone smoothly. Still, with this upgrade being activated for the first time during Crew Ace return, Dragon becomes an even more reliable spacecraft. This new capability also casts a bit of a shadow on Boeing's Starliner, which has faced numerous delays and technical issues over the years. In contrast, SpaceX continues to refine Dragon, making it a stronger competitor in the world of crewed spaceflight. 
Speaking of crewed missions, Crew-9 also brought a notable change. For the first time, a crewed mission will launch from SpaceX's SLC-40 launch pad at Cape Canaveral, rather than the iconic LC-39A. Up until now, all NASA and private crewed missions have used LC-39A, which has a long history of human spaceflight. To prepare for this shift, SpaceX has made significant upgrades to SLC-40, including the installation of a crew access arm and an emergency abort system. This now makes SLC-40 fully capable of handling crewed missions, effectively sharing the workload with LC-39A and providing SpaceX with a backup launch option. The new setup has received positive feedback. Bill Gerstenmayer praised the SLC-40 launch pad, especially noting that the slide chute emergency system is more efficient than the wire and basket system used at LC-39A. More importantly, transferring some crewed missions to SLC-40 frees up LC-39A for Starship operations in the future. NASA has been concerned about Starship activities interfering with Falcon 9 missions, but now with both pads in action, the logistics should be much smoother for everyone involved. Let's keep an eye on how Dragon's new upgrades and mission plans unfold. Well folks, that's about it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and as always, this has been Kevin from Great SpaceX. Until next time, keep looking up.